Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Sinoe. I'm an architectural specialist here at ArtX. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you for joining us from today's Learn From Home webinar. Today is a very special edition of this webinar series. We are welcoming a special guest speaker, Mr. Scott Carruthers. Scott has quite the impressive list of accolades with over 39 years of experience in the tile industry. Currently, he is the Director of Certification and training for the Ceramic Tile Education Foundation, and he's heavily involved in providing training to those in the tile industry. He has served as the president and chairman of the board of the National Tile Contractors Association, or the NTCA, uh, the chairman of the NTCA Technical Committee. He was named the NTCA Person of the Year in 2005 and received the NTCA Ring of Honor in 2013. He is also a voting member of the ANSI and the TCNA handbook committees. In our session today, Scott will be speaking on tile installation and selecting qualified labor. He will also discuss installation of large format engaged porcelain tiles and discuss why qualified labor is paramount when installing these tile types. On behalf of the team at Artex, I would like to thank Scott for sharing his time and knowledge with all of us today. Please note that unfortunately, today's presentation does not count for AIA credits. However, this is an amazing opportunity to hear from one of the top experts in this field. We will still provide certificates for today. Um, you should expect to see those by email early next week. As we go through the presentation, feel free to ask questions for Scott in the questions panel. We will read them at the very end of today's presentation. And with that, I'm honored to turn it over to Scott. So Scott, go ahead and take it away. Alyssa, thank you for your kind words and to uh, Ardex for this opportunity. It's my pleasure to be here and just share a little bit of news about the tile industry and hopefully that all of us can do a better job. So let's get right to it. We're gonna to talk today about qualified labor the documents that are included and a possible solution to some of the difficulties that we see in the marketplace today. Our objectives are to understand the differences between what we see in the field, whether it be top quality work or something less than that. What is the definition of qualified labor? How does the TCNA handbook define this and, and enumerate those qualities that are necessary? And where do we find these people? And where are they in the field? We look at these installations that I have a couple of uh, photos here that uh, this particular one is a complete hotel restoration of a historic site uh, on the East Coast. Very, very nicely done. Uh, just look at the detail that's in this. Even though it's not done yet, you can just appreciate the beauty uh, and, the, and the craftsmanship that went into putting this into place. Same hotel, beautiful tile work. Notice the radius cuts at the balusters at your left and the one to the far right. Beautiful installation work, no lippage, just gorgeous, gorgeous work. We get to the residential side, also very, very intricate and nicely completed work. A little detail there where the black absolute pencil surrounds the hexagon tile into the field of subway tile, just very nicely done. And this is just gorgeous. This church facility was unbelievable. Uh, you'll notice that the pulpit to the lower right seems to be floating because there's no support underneath it. The, the way it's constructed it looks as though it's standing in air, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful illustration of what natural stone can show us. On the residential side as well, this is a swimming pool grotto that was done uh, on the West Coast. Look at the detail, the beauty of the, of the mosaics that were set on the ceiling. I mean, it's almost like the Sistine Chapel. You've got the, a beautiful array of very, very nicely done work. Imagine laying on your back inside that grotto on a summer afternoon, putting those tiles in place, but they are just very nicely done. And just, and again, an example of quality craftsmanship. 
And here's an artist at work. This is Joshua Nordstrom. He has designed, hand cut, and installed that octopus in a residential stall shower. And if you look at the finished product, look at the detail. And again, this was not a, a product that he bought off the shelf and ready to go. He actually designed and hand cut each of those pieces in different colored products to give us the view of what we see with this octopus. And notice the detail. The, the one tentacle goes right through the corner shelf and there's no loss of detail. It just is absolutely gorgeous. All of these ones that I've just shown you are award winners from this year, uh, 2020 coverings, uh, installation and design award winners. That's the CID award winners. So I wanted to show those off because it's really nice to see the great work because unfortunately, we sometimes only hear about or see the ones that are less than stellar. And that's what we'll take a look at painfully next. In this case, we have glass tile, which is very popular in showers. If you don't know, glass is exponentially expansive. So when we get it into a high temperature environment, it has a tendency to want to grow. And if we don't give it anywhere to go, this is the result that we find. And if you look at a larger view, you see there that quite a number of the tiles are fractured in some way, uh, all of which are defective. So they had to be replaced. And, and we find out, okay, where's the, where's the dilemma? Well, here's the dilemma. It's the corners. There is not a single expansion joint in this entire shower installation. The arrow to the top is the subway tile above the mosaics. That joint is a 32nd to a 16th at its best, and it's hard grouted. The joint between the mosaics is actually a knife joint. There's, there's no joint there whatsoever. In fact, in areas, some of the, it had no area, uh, area of grout because the joint was so tight that you could not get anything in there. With no room for expansion, that glass had nowhere to go but crack, and that was a, a very unfortunate failure. Looking at a brand new uh, commercial restroom uh, in a mall facility, beautifully installed 12 by 24s. Grout joints are straight both directions. There is no lippage. It is just a gorgeous installation until the owner started to complain about hollow sounding tile. And if you see that red dot to the side on the left, you see the other piece on the right, that's the, res the result, that's the piece that came off. And for some reason there was orange spray paint on this floor in various different locations that was not removed and it was a bond breaker and the tile came loose. But really the primary issue here is that the trowel notch was incorrect. There was not an adequate amount of mortar. It was not troweled in a straight direction and therefore was not enough to transfer and bond the tile uh, tightly enough and it turned loose in a very short period of time. Here we have a commercial kitchen with quarry tile. Uh, notice that it has tented because there's not a single expansion joint in this entire commercial kitchen of several thousand feet. This one is really interesting because we see that the tent is not only going north and south, it's also going east and west. So there was pressure coming from both directions and caused it to pop normally in the center of the installation. And of course, a very, very unfortunate failure. And we look at this next photo, we see that that had tented about three quarters of an inch up off the floor. It had nowhere to go but up. There's a couple of difficulties with this whole installation, which would take longer than we have time to explain, but take a look in particular at the concrete adjacent to the ruler. It's shiny. And notice the water droplets on there. It's almost as if you had waxed your vehicle and have water drops after a rainstorm. Those water droplets indicate there's no porosity to the surface and therefore the thin set had nothing to bond to and the entire installation failed. Beautiful installation. Commercial stall shower, gang shower, very nicely done with a large format subway tile. And we see the detail of the trench drain in front of the wall uh, to the lower center of the, of the photograph. Just very, very nicely done. But 
it's not quite so good because what we're going to find now that what you see on the left is the photo with temporary lighting. When the final lighting was installed, we get that. And I can't hear the interactive report from you folks on the other end, but I can just hear the moans and groans coming about. And if I show you, this is the exact same photograph, almost exactly. If you notice the, the proximity of the, of the mixing valve on the, on the right, it's almost exactly the same picture framed. And there you see on the left, that's a great, that's an acceptable installation. On the right, that is not acceptable. And the key is that LED can light was right at the wall line. And that wall wash lighting accentuates the irregularities possibly of the tile or of the substrate or of the installation itself and is not acceptable. So the key is to get those lights, fixtures, or trough lighting away from that wall ceiling interface about 24 inches away from the wall and we get back to the installation which is perfectly acceptable which we see on the left hand side. And then this is probably the cancer of the industry, spot bonding. It has never been approved, still is not, and never will be approved for any type of installation, especially when we get into an exterior environment. If you notice to the right with the arrow, there's snow. So it's a freeze thaw application. There's moisture condensing behind the wall. Notice that we also have water weeping out through the grout joints and starting to stain the face of the would look tile and it's just there was no bond to the tile the tile was loose and you can see the extreme hollow voids around the perimeter of the tile in any environment this is not acceptable but in a freeze thaw it's fatal in this case it did deteriorate so enough of those let's look at the documents that we have in the industry for us to rely upon for the specifications that we are going to work with ANSI provides us with A137.1, which is the standards for ceramic tile, which does include porcelain as well. We have 137.2, which is glass tile. 137.3 is for gauge porcelain tile and gauge porcelain tile panels and slabs. Also in this document has the A108.19 installation specifications, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We have the A138.1 for green squared. And probably the workhorse of the industry is our A108 and A118.136 specification for standards of products and installation uh, for the tile that we see in the other three to the left. And the last one, the Bible of the industry is the TCNA handbook. Some of you may, may not be aware, but the TCNA handbook is not a specification guide. Many people seem to think that the handbook uh, is loaded with specifications, and actually it is not. There are no specifications in the handbook. They all come from ANSI. However, as we look at the handbook comparison between the two, we have methods and details in the handbook. But the standards specifications come from all the ANSI documents. So it is true that the methods and details in the handbook rely heavily upon the standards that come out of the, in this case, the A108 or uh, 118 for installation and product, installation products. But there are no standards in the TCNA handbook. So let's talk about the crux of what we're here today to discuss and that is qualified labor. This language is in the TCNA handbook and we'll see where else it is located as well. So let's determine what is qualified. So we find that that's having particular abilities, qualities or attributes necessary to perform a particular job or task. Seems pretty straightforward. Meeting the proper standards, requirements, and training for the position. So we have to have some form of training and know what we are doing in the field. We have to be competent and eligible. Eligible meaning that we have those two parameters above 
that we meet the requirements of our industry. Labor, that's the physical or mental effort, sometimes difficult in nature. We have the ability to provide goods and services that feed the economy and the services performed for the worker receiving wages. So I've written this statement as one that sort of brings that all together. A person who through training, both physically and mentally, along with hard work, has gained the necessary abilities, skills, qualities, and experience to provide the goods and services desired by the consumer. So as we look at the handbook on page 51, the heading is the installer and contractor qualification guide. So there's going to be a number of things that we will work through that tell us what is required for this qualified labor label. We look at today's installations and many things on, the, on job sites are prefabbed in a, in a factory and there's nothing wrong with that. But really when we come down to it, tile is one of the last things that are actually built by hand. These pieces are either fabbed in a shop and taken to the job site and then assembled or the actual pieces are cut and fit on the job site one piece at a time. So how does it look? How long is it going to last? That's the critical thing about ceramic installations and that's the beauty of what we do because the things that we do are for the long term. These are not short term things like some of the uh, other plastic materials that we see in the field today that have a very limited uh, lifespan. Ceramic tile is, is a lifetime product and it works very, very effectively and very, very well. The handbook committee also has a recommendation for the installers who have been working at their craft and they are committed to it. They don't do it as a part-time job, although there's nothing wrong with a part-time installer, but people that are actually committed to doing this on the day-to-day -day basis, and that's their craft. They stay current with those things that become new. I have probably, and most of us on this webinar have heard this statement, I've been doing this for X number of years and you can't show me anything. Well, when they say that they've been doing it for 20 years and, and never had a problem the issue is that they are making that statement not knowing that most of the products that they utilize today weren't even conceived 20 years ago so they're out of date they need to get to the current materials that we're using today and along with those there are also new skills and abilities that are necessary for the installation of these products as they change because they may not work in the same fashion as they did 10 12 15 years ago and the only way to get that is by attending something like this webinar or uh, when we're able to do a, an in-person training event where you can get hands-on to a product or a, a method so that that is really critical for the ongoing education of the installer in the field. And here's probably the biggest one in the handbook is the fact that the, is, this language is out of the handbook that says that you should not consider the lowest bid, but rather the most qualified person to perform the scope of the work specified. So the low bid may look like the lowest price, but many of us have been involved, unfortunately, in things that have gone bad, and we find out that the job has to be removed and replaced, and the exponential cost of making that whole again is way, way beyond the money saved between the lowest bid and the lowest qualified bid. So I would encourage you to make sure that we're looking at the qualified bid rather than the lowest price. A portfolio is great, especially on the residential side for finding out what you have done and show the work. Uh, Joshua Nordstrom's photograph of that uh, octopus in the shower has become uh, almost viral on Facebook, and, and rightfully so, and that's his work. But unfortunately, we find that there are people that are pirating photographs off the internet and utilizing them in their own website or portfolio. Um, I was taken back not too long ago whenever I was uh, perusing the internet and I saw a photograph on a Bing search file that was mine. 
I took that photograph and I used it in a presentation that I had done. So apparently somebody lifted it off my presentation and somehow it found its way onto a Bing search engine. But the real piece de resistance was whenever I saw one of my photographs on an installer's website. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't very happy. I called him and said, you know, if you're going to show your work, make sure it's yours, not mine. But that's unfortunately what we find happening uh, in the environment today. References. Can't say enough about references because if the person is a, has the ability to do the work, especially the scope and complexity, there's nothing wrong with people that specialize in backsplashes, but we are sure as the world not going to hire that person to do a stall shower or even more complex, a steam shower. So make sure that the person is qualified for what you're in, encountering. When I get technical calls uh, given to me on a regular basis, I usually, after I hear this, the horror story, ask three questions. One is, did you take the lowest bid? Well, of course, stripe one. Did you get and check references? Well, they said they were good, and the guys down the, down the block said that they had heard they did a good job. Strike two. Did you at that point get a contract? And they said, well, he gave me a price and I thought it looked good. So we went with him. So you have no idea what is going to be included or excluded on the job. Strike three, you're out. So references are critical. We well, don't want to know what that installer's experience level is what training they have gained, if they were required to have licenses. We just changed our website and put a note on our website uh, search engine for installers, certified installers, uh, saying that licensing may be required in your locality, so you want to make sure that you check that as part of your search. If they have been certified, certainly that is a credential that they should shout from the rooftops. And bottom line, does the work meet the local codes where the work is being accomplished because codes are extremely different around the country. So we've got to make sure that that code is being followed. Ceramic Tile Education Foundation has our contractor questionnaire on our website at ceramictilefoundation.org. You're welcome to do that and utilize that to your advantage. We have uh, quite an extensive questionnaire for uh, hiring that contractor, the questions you should ask, do they have insurance, and, and a bevy of other questions to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples on the bids that you are receiving. We also have our tip sheet, which is a little shorter version, and you can go on there and get that one as well. There are various programs administered uh, by associations, uh, nonprofits such as CTEF. Uh, the union is a nonprofit, and there are private companies as well that are uh, for profit, and that's fine. As long as they are administered and conducted properly and follow the industry guidelines to the letter, because when we deviate from them, we create hybrids, and that gets everybody in trouble. We want to make sure that the education and the hands on training, which for an installer is paramount, that we have both. And when they have re reached a level of uh, uh, accuracy in the work that they do, have those skills evaluated and be certified for the work that is being done. It's important that we distinguish between many of the programs that are out there. And the first one is classroom, much in the way of this one, an online training program. And for the knowledge part of it, that is great, some of which have testing involved as well to give you a certificate of attendance or completion. And they certainly serve the a and D community well, as well as uh, salespeople, whether they be on the counter or out in the field, to get them up to speed on the knowledge necessary for uh, specifying the products that they are selling. The hands-on is without question. Again, in the times we find ourselves now, hands-on is just about non-existent, but we're looking forward to the time when we can get back on the road and put that hands-on training where it needs to occur. Again, ultimately getting that certification so that the contractors are out there. It's like comparing the apple to the orange. How do you know which one of the installers that should be in front of you uh, is qualified to do the work that you have proposed? Certification is that vehicle. 
those hands-on skills and the knowledge go hand in hand for a, an installer. And the bottom one is the rigor and the credibility of the program. Make sure that the program that's being uh, in questioned is legitimate. There are some training programs that out there that put the certification label on, but they're a training program uh, and don't really test certifiable skills. So just make sure that the program being considered is legitimate and is recognized by the tile industry as well as the Tile Council of North America. These are a list of uh, programs and nonprofits that are out there on the market. The ACT program, the Advanced Certifications for Tile Installers, we already mentioned CTEF. Uh, MTEF is the International Masonry Institute uh, Education Foundation. They just changed their name. That's why I stumbled on that one. They just changed that recently. But MTEF uh, through the union, the journeyman program for apprenticeship, the National Natural Stone Institute accreditation program for installation contractors is very viable for uh, natural stone installations. National Tile Contractors Association has their five-star program. And in a similar fashion, the Tile Contractors Association of America, the TCAA, has their trial of excellence program. And there are other programs on the market, but just make sure that they do meet the criteria that is required. When we talk about the ACT program, this was a collaboration of the organizations, and I won't read that list again because you all pretty much know who they are. Uh, we met as a group in October of 2012 and conceptually developed this idea of testing tile installers and one board member said to me, Scott, that is a really lofty goal. Do you think you can get it done? I said, we'll get it done. We developed that idea the last week of October in 12 and the middle of March in Atlanta in 2013, we ran our first ACT testing. So we got it up and running and it is up and alive. Unfortunately, right now we've had to curtail that because of the pandemic situation in which we find ourselves. CTEF and MTEF are the two testing bodies within these organizations, testing the installers, whether they be open shop or uh, union affili affiliated. The quality assurance, this is the sample language that's in the handbook. It's also in another form, which we'll look at in just a moment. But the quality assurance section of the spec now lists these items, these five items that will be qualifications that the architect or specifier can utilize for building their specification to get strong language in there to get qualified labor, not only spec'd, but utilized on the job site. In the ACT program, we have seven programs that are now in place. That's our large format and substrate prep, membranes, shower receptors, mud floors, mud walls, grouts, and the last one is gauge porcelain tile and gauge porcelain tile panels and slabs. If you look at the master spec, this is relative to section 9300 for tile, and that spec in master spec, again, this is a cut and paste document for the use by the architect and specifier, is very similar to what we see in the handbook and it gives them that ability to give them a good spec that will give qualified labor the, re the requirement for uh, the people that would be installing the tile. But we have to look at the pyramid, not the one on the right, but this one. We have the ANSI standards and the handbook details as the base. That's our foundation. We then next have the uh, manufacturers' products, they are our building blocks. So we're building from the foundation, we're building that up with the products that are available, both tile and installation materials. But the last one is the code. The International Co Code Council has two of those and they have the final word. And when we look at these together, you'll see, here's the documents that we see in the industry that give us our standards and methods. Then we go to the manufacturer. They provide products that meet or exceed the standards that we just saw in that last slide. 
whether it be a tile product or an installation product, they have a specific use and they tell us how to handle those products in the field. They also have application guidelines that are critical. If it's usable in a wet, dry environment, is it usable in an exterior application? Is it usable in a submerged situation? All critical things that need to be followed and referenced by the installer through the manufacturer. And lastly, those manufacturers provide a warranty. We get through that. We've got the standards, we've got the products, we've got the materials in place, we've put this product in place, let's say it's a stall shower, then we get to the codes. The code can vary from one city to another, to from one borough to the next, to the township, to the adjacent one. They can be widely varying, so we've got to be really careful that we're utilizing installation techniques and products that are recognized by the code in that particular area whether it's commercial in the IBC or whether it's residential in the IRC, make sure that those code requirements are being met. So let's look at a solution. The ACT program, which I've alluded to fairly often throughout our talk this morning, or this afternoon rather, here's our drill down board. As we look at the top, you have to be a, a brick or allied craft worker uh, union member as an apprentice, or a journey worker, or you've got to be certified by the Ceramic Tile Education Foundation. Within this program, we have a rigorous written exam that the test taker must achieve an 84% grade. Then we move to the hands-on test, which is requiring an 85% passing score. And then at that point, they would be issued a certification for whichever number of one through seven methods for certification through ACT. Our program is very comprehensive and is extremely detail oriented. For instance, if we are testing uh, stall showers and it requires a sealant to be applied between the base of the drain and the underside of the pan liner, there are multiple different caulkings and sealants available for their use. If the installer doesn't use the appropriate sealant, they will fail the test. They are provided with a study guide that fully describes all the requirements of the test. They'll know exactly what they're expected to do and how it's to be performed, and there are no secrets to this test. So all that is, a, is applied up front. We do have critical points, which I just alluded to. If it's not done correctly, the test will fail, and I'll show you one in just a moment. The installer has to use the appropriate products with that manufacturer. So if they have two membranes that they can select, they have to use the products that are made by that manufacturer and work with that as a system, or again, they would fail the test. These critical points are based on ANSI standards, the handbook details, as well as the manufacturer's recommendations. So we look at large format tile, and in this case, we have all that alphabet soup and number soup at the bottom of the page, and I'm gonna dance through this quickly. The first one on the left, which is 4.1.4.3.1, and by the way, I'm gonna drop the points because it just gets too much of a tongue tire. But that one is the one that establishes the flat plane for large format tile. In this case, it has to be an eighth of an inch in 10 feet. The second one is the installation for uh, tile using a dry set or a modified dry set mortar for tile installation. The third one, the 4381, is the one that tells us that if the large format tile, the grout joint, and it's rectified, the grout joint has to be a minimum of an eighth of an inch. If it's non-rectified, calibrated tile, it would be three sixteenths of an inch. The last one, 4382, is the one that tells us with large format tile, which is what we have here in a 12 by 24, would be a maximum of a 33% offset. As you look at this, there's a, there's a, error in this rendering and those of you that are out there watching well we're going to do a little contest here and 
Alyssa is going to have the question panel open. The question is, what's the error in this rendering that you see right now? And by the way, they'll have a nice Ardex prize uh, to the winner. And we'll announce that when we get to the end. So now we look at this. Here's the failure point. This installer did a great job. Flattened the plane to within the industry tolerances. Installed the tile with a one-third offset, one-eighth inch grout joint, zero lippage. Beautiful job. Went to pull the tile and we realized we've got some problems. Now, you'll notice on the tile, which is laying on, the, on its face on the right-hand side, the installer back buttered and, and the NTCA has just changed that now to be more accurately saying flat back troweled. It's a little bit of a tongue tip twister, but that does not, and many people have this misconception, it does not increase your coverage. Yes, it does increase bond strength because you're physically keying the mortar into the back of the tile, and some tile with a lot of profile on the backside is well served by using uh, flat back troweling, but it doesn't increase the coverage. And if we look now, we see that he has possibly 50% coverage because the one half by one half inch trowel that was used didn't have the ability to knock the ridges down into the valleys and get that 80% coverage requirement and so forth. He did everything correct except for troweling the mortar uh, in that fashion and failed the test. When we move to membranes, the 108.13 is the installation for a bonded waterproof membrane and we're testing two items one on the left is a liquid product with the fabric that may be required for it with the designated upturns and inside and outside corners as well as the interface with the drain and the pipe protrusion the one on the right that's not started as yet is going to be a sheet membrane which has to be done in the same fashion properly installed properly flashed uh, inside and outside corners properly addressed, and they have to put a seam in it between the pipe and the drain. So the ANSI requirement for the lap and the sealant required for that is, is critical. When we move to mud floors, we're now looking at handbook method F111, which is an unbonded mortar bed. You'll notice that the uh, cleavage membrane, in this case, in it looking like uh, felt paper, is installed on the bottom and a little trivia note here for you. Uh, if you don't know that the ANSI requirement for most membranes is a two inch overlap, this is the only one in the, in the ANSI book that requires a four inch overlap on that cleavage membrane as opposed to a two inch. You'll see the metal that is uh, suspended in the mortar bed and you'll see next that that X area is where the installer must work from. They're not allowed to go around the perimeter to pack their mortar or to screed it off. So they have to do all the work. And by the way, this is only half of it. This is actually a U-shape, but I used this one for a cutaway so you can see it a little bit better. And the real critical point right here is they have to have exactly an inch and a half of mortar right at that corner, that uh, outside corner. And then from there, set their spots and get it to a flat and level plane. When we move to mud walls, this is built on handbook detail W222, which is the one coat method. And you'll notice that the installation on a solid backing has the vapor retarding membrane, the 2.5 galvanized diamond mesh, and then the mortar itself. And that has to be somewhere between three eighths and three quarters of an inch in thickness. The walls got to be plumb. When you get to that inside corner, that has to have a positive stop in the, in the wire. The wire can't turn the corner, it needs to be broken there. And also there has to be an, a minimum expansion space of an eighth to a quarter to allow for movement accommodation to take place. The knee wall has to be plumb and level as well. And the inside and outside corner has to be square. So it's quite an extensive test for the abilities of mud walls. When we move to showers, this is built on handbook detail B415, and that's either cement backer board or fiber cement backer board. However, each of those is installed somewhat differently. So the one that you see shown in the rendering 
is actually a cement backer board. It requires a pre-slope and the pan liner, as well as the mortar bed. And the mortar bed has to be inch and a half, and that has to be consistently in depth at the drain, as well as the um, furthest point from the drain. So it's always it's an inch and a half throughout the entire pan, and of course has to have the plumbing code requirement of one quarter inch per 12 inches of fall. Last thing that needs to be done there is the mud curb, which is with 2.5 galvanized diamond mesh, and that's the one coat method there as well. Something on the horizon, we have a couple of new ones that we are incorporating into the program. These are brand new. They're not on the market yet as far as a test, but we are finalizing B421, which is a bonded waterproof membrane that would tie into the drain at the interface and then continue up to the shower head. The one on the right is B422, which is using a bonded uh, membrane to an integrated bonding flange. And again, it would continue up to the shower head as well. These are two very popular systems that are out there in the market. And we are bringing those into the ACT Corral so that we have a testing of program that is going to be encompassing all the most popular methods on the market today. When we move to grouts, A108.10 is one that is testing uh, the installation of grout. 108.6, section 3.0 is epoxy, so that the quarry tile floor is epoxy. The walls are cement grout. And EJ171, we're testing the ability of the installer to make a T-shaped generic joint in his expansion, as well as an expansion joint where the wall floor interface of the four and a quarter wall tile on the right side and the vertical corner as well. And we'll look at those next. So we have an expansion joint, which is not a part of the test, but there's the generic joint, which means there's a bond breaker tape underneath it. And the critical statement that has to be made here is that this is right out of the handbook, out of the second paragraph. The design professional or engineer shall show the specific locations and details of movement joints on project drawings. It is not the job of the tile installer or contractor to design, place, or detail those expansion joints. When we move that joint to the wall, we have a similar bond breaker tape installed so that we get sealant going to work accurately along that non-moving wall. And when we look on the right-hand side, we see the perimeter movement joints. There's your wall floor interface, the inside corners. And if we're on an exterior application, we also have to make sure that we have that outside corner as a soft joint as well. When we look at gauge porcelain tile, this is a very detail-oriented. It has to be sized. That two pieces on the back have to be sized both width and height with a profile installed around all three sides, the floor to a specific side, and the knee wall cutting in the tub filler and the spout and an electrical box, all of that encapsulated with a profile as well. And this is out of A108.19. The website for ACT is tilecertifications.com. You'll notice that we have at the top, each one of the categories is a hot button and you can go there it'll give you a brief overview of each of the uh, test criteria as well as uh, the, the list right here and we also see that you can contact uh, ACT testing through the Ceram Tile Education Foundation or the International Masonry Institute and they are hot on the website or the phone numbers are listed for your use. This is the unique document that I alluded to earlier. This is the A137.3. This is the uh, standard for gauge porcelain tile and gauge porcelain tile panels and slabs. The sister to that is A108.19, which is the installation. This is the only ANSI document in existence that has the tile and its installation technique all in one document. Made sense because it's so unique. And coming soon, we have the newest edition will be A108.20, which is the exterior application of gauge porcelain tile panel. 
Here we have an installer cutting a, a, a rectangular uh, box out of a piece of tile, protecting the edge. Got a little water there to make sure that uh, the blade stays cool and, and removes the dust. When he cuts this, he always drills the four corners with a diamond core bit and cuts to it. You never cut square corners in this product because they can fracture rather easily. So drill round corners, cut to the corner, and life is good. Handling it, notice there's three installers, not one. So they're picking that up out of the crate with a rack to keep it nice and straight and not twisting it so that they can get it safely to the table for mortar and then to the wall. So here we see the mortar being applied to the back. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, folks would not recognize this trowel, but that's either the, uh, the zipper notch or what's known as a Euro trowel or also a slant notch. Notice that the mortar is troweled in parallel to the short side rather than the long side. And when we get to the wall, you'll notice the wall mortar is also troweled in parallel to the short side. It's already applied to the back of the panel. Now we have four installers. And that's the guy I want, is that guy on the right. You need the tall guy who's going to be able to get that panel up to a vertical plane, get it in place, but not touch the wall until you have it exactly where you want it because it doesn't adjust well. So you want to make sure it's properly aligned when you get it to that point. Beautiful installation. This is a dealership in Kansas City. This was done in the winter time before the standard was established. Beautiful installation. I took this picture and it's a gorgeous installation. I actually handed those joints because that's how flush everything is. It's very nicely done. About 2,400 square feet. And if we look at the detail over the windows, you'll notice the columns between the windows, they carry that same line up through the gauge porcelain tile panel so that they can put uh, movement accommodation joints above each one of those windows in those columns. And we look here at the side view, we'll see very nicely done. And you'll see that the uh, grout joint, oh, sorry, there aren't any. This entire installation of 2,400 square feet was 100% silicone. There is no grout joints anywhere against the windows or against any of the tile panels abutting one another. It is all 100% silicone for movement accommodation. We can do beautiful installations on the inside. We can do kitchens and countertops. This is really the classic, I think. You can take this product and put it over top of a presently sound installation, and we can go over top of that dated one by one. Proper preparation, in this case, putting a primer on top of the, the tile before the panels are installed. Three days later, went from black mosaics to a, an updated modern look and it really made a very nice installation. The beauty of this is there's no tear out, there's no dirt, there's no noise, there's no landfill, and you're done in three days. If we do that tile over tile, which is possible, that's fine, but the mortar must be combed parallel as the arrow, parallel to the short side of the tile so that we can get the air moved from underneath that tile. When it's trout in a swirl pattern, as you see here, the air is trapped and your coverage and your bond will be compromised. So our best scenario is to work together. If the architect provides us with the, the top quality drawings and specs, life is really good, but we really need to ask the architect to hold that spec on qualified labor. We want to make sure that the GC and the builder also honor that spec by using qualified labor because, as we saw, the lowest price is not always the lowest cost. And ultimately, hire that qualified labor contractor. So, Alyssa, at this point, I am done. And I hope that was worthwhile. And I'm going to go back to our, our quiz for the day. And do we have a winner? Um, why don't we let um, give this another shot, just a few more seconds. If you know what's wrong with the photo, submit in the questions panel. I'm going to count to 15 um, <laughs> and we'll see um, if we have a winner. So Okay, that's fair. Count in my head and save everyone from counting out loud. Okay. Okay, I think we have a winner. 
uh, Andrew Gromlich. Um, I'll be reaching out to you to get your information. Um, but he said the gr or oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, he said the grout. It is that is incorrect. Um, winner number two. Winner number two works for Ardex. So <laughs> um, anyone else? Aha, uh -huh. Aster Paz, the thin set line should be going the other way. Ding, there ding, we go. Ding. There we go, a winner. The reason for that, this rendering is in error and we need to replace it, but I used it for the purpose of showing that something as minute as troweling the long direction, which realize that that's a 12 by 24, which it is, we have to push the air 12 inches each way to get it expelled from underneath the tile. If we trial the short way, we only have to push the air six inches each way, half as far. And, and that gets exponentially harder because if you're using a, an eight by 48 and you trial the long way, you've got to push the air two feet. And it's really difficult to do that. So it's really a much better installation to trial the short way, which I showed you on that gauge portion tile panel, much easier to expel the air both on the wall and on the floor. So congratulations to our winner. All right. Um, so do you are you ready to take some questions? How about that? All right, perfect. Um, what tile or stone products do you see being the most challenging to currently install? So in today's marketplace, uh, what products are the most difficult to install? Um, do you have any that you think that are no deal options? I won't say difficult, Alyssa, but what we just talked about, the gauge porcelain tile panels and slabs, if the person has not received training either through the manufacturer of the tile or a facility such as Ardex that makes the setting and grouting materials or through uh, any other training programs that are available out there, it's very difficult. I have had the horror calls on a tech tech line. Uh, they've tried to install the gauge porcelain tile. One of the guys called me and he said he'd been doing it for 30 years. And I'm thinking, gee, it's not been on the market that long. I don't know how you've been doing it for 30 years, but okay, I'll take your word for it. And he went through this scenario and I said, what do you mean? He, he said that he couldn't make the panel stay on the wall. It was sliding down. And I said, oh. sliding down? What mortar did you use? He said, I use the same glue I use all the time. So he put that panel up with ceramic wall tile adhesive. And of course it didn't it didn't set up because it has no way to breathe because he was on a membrane behind it and the porcelain tile has no porosity. Well, it actually is one half of 1%. So it had no way to cure and it was it was still fluid and he couldn't keep it in place when he pulled his props out the next day the panel started to slide down the wall. So difficult, yeah, in the sense that he wasn't properly trained. Difficulty in installing, boy, that's a tough question without knowing the context. Maybe that person will fire the other half of that question and I'll, I'll follow up. Gotcha. Um, the next question, I see qualified labor listed in specifications, yet these contractors bidding don't know or have any of the certifications. How do we get more qualified contractors bidding commercial work? Read that question one more time. I want to make sure I caught the first part, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so often this person sees qualified labor mentioned in specifications, um, but the contractors that are bidding these projects don't know or have any of these certifications. Um, how do you think we can get more qualified contractors to bid this commercial work? I or how do we spread the word about training? Uh, are, we, <laughs> well? are we talking about qualified as in the GC or the tile installer? I can go both ways. If it's a tile um, installer, we go ahead. Maybe you have some insight. Oh, I was going to say, why don't you answer both sections of that then? Okay. If it's the installer, it's incumbent upon them to become certified to show that they have the talent 
and the knowledge and stay current with the installation of the products, especially in something like gauge porcelain tile panels. On the GC side, unfortunately, we see too many jobs being bid on price. And the lower price is not going to be indicative of a quality level. And that's the point that I made in that next to the last slide, where if we have a good spec and the architect holds the spec and the GC respects that spec, it works. But when it's put out to the lowest bidder and the job doesn't succeed because they don't have the qualifications, hence qualified labor, the job fails. And what that does, it gives the entire tile industry a black eye. Um, and then we spoke a lot about ANSI standards. Um, so there was a question about explaining the difference between the ANSI and the ISO standards and, and your thoughts there. Okay, the ANSI specs are the American National Standards Institute, and they are the guidelines that we have created and follow in the United States. ISO is a worldwide organization, that's the International Standards Organization, and they have done a great job as well. Uh, when you compare the two of them, they are very, very similar. There are only two items that really are in conflict between the ISO and ANSI. Uh, will they ever mesh? Could possibly, I don't know that. They made a crystal ball to determine whether they will or will not. There are manufacturers that in the, in the US that note both ANSI and ISO standards. And that, as I said, they are, they are similar except for two, two categories. And there's really not a negative to one or the other. Uh, I get questions from Canada fairly often. And I said, well, you don't follow the ANSI standards full fledged and you don't really follow ISO. So uh, I really, I don't have an answer because it's really indicative of where you're located what the specifications are for that particular country. I see. Um, and then the last question we had, I think we have time for, um, is in regards to substrate preparation. Mm -hmm. um, how substrate, how much does substrate prep add to the quality of the installation? And then um, do you think that there will be a standard, you know, a, a certification surrounding around substrate prep in the future? We already have one. Perfect. It's okay. Uh, large format tile and substrate prep is an ACT test. And in that case, the installer is given a surface that is not flat, and they have to utilize the materials at hand to make it flat within the industry tolerance. In the case of large format tile, it's got to be within an eighth of an inch and 10 feet. So the test is already there, and the certification is already there. Give Great. me your first question again. I missed that. Oh, um, let me. First part of it. I'm sorry. Sorry, I lost it in my sea of questions here. <laughs> All right. Uh, how, how much does substrate prep add oh. to the quality of the installation? Oh, thank you for saving that question. Of course. We can't say enough about substrate prep. Uh, there have been products on the market, and I'll name it, it's medium bed mortars where uh, unfortunately, the architectural community embraced that as a floor repair system, and it was never designed to be that. Uh, in error, they have been called out as using the medium bed method, and that is something that has never existed. Uh, it, it became popular, but it never existed, so there wasn't a medium bed system or an installation system. Mortar manufacturers did, in fact, develop and produce medium bed mortars, but that whole system has now changed to a new category known as large and heavy tile mortars because they really describe better what they do. They're made to support the heavier tile, like a stone tile, or the larger products as we see in gauge porcelain tile because they have different weight characteristics and the larger tiles create a whole number, another dynamic. So utilizing those, I can't say enough about substrate prep. You saw that picture with the quarry tile where we had uh, a tenting situation. 
the majority of that problem was the zero substrate prep. That was an existing floor that was quote unquote cleaned and then tiled over with a with a crack isolation membrane and then the tile and it's still tented. Now, the fault of no expansion joints was part of it, but that floor was clean as you saw in the pictures. That wasn't that wasn't uh, scarified or any kind of cleaning done to take that picture. That was after the tile was pulled up and the, the vacuum was run. That's how clean that floor was. So substrate prep is critical for the installation. And if it's not done right, whether it's a wall with form oil or any kind of contaminant or a concrete slab that would have curing compound, they all have to be removed. And there are no chemical means that really do that. And I'll, I'll say period right there. They, they must be removed in a mechanical fashion, either with shot blast, bead blast, or some kind of mechanical abrasion to get those products removed. Great. Awesome. Um, well, Scott, I speak again on behalf of Artex. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your time and your knowledge. Um, a quick reminder to the group that today, unfortunately, did not count for AIA credits. However, you will receive a certificate of completion um, early next week via email. So keep on the lookout for that. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks again, Scott. This was extremely educational. We appreciate it so much. My pleasure, Alyssa, and to everyone at Ardex for the opportunity. I thank them as well.